So we're going to get ready to get started here soon. But Matthew, glad you're here. God bless you. And um, uh, in the um, we're going to begin be beginning in your handbooks and your curriculum books on page two forty. So um, hopefully you'll you have some time to be able to start catching up on some of the past classes, Matthew. Uh, but um, we're, we're certainly glad that you're here. Amen. So yeah, tonight we're going to continue um, speaking on the five methods or the five flows of prophesying. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit in the beginning, just kind of from my heart. And um, next week, uh, Brother Isaac Fogoso is going to be closing up this season of teaching. And, and, and this is something we do with the Spirit Led Supernatural School of Ministry, not only do we want everybody to learn God's voice and to hear God's voice and to be able to feel comfortable with prophesying and understand that you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. You don't have to be weird. You don't have to be, it's just only <laughs> God's voice. And that's what we teach. Well, some of us are weird, but that's, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> you just don't have to be weird. But, um, you know, we, we just believe and we teach that that being a believer, you can hear and know God's voice. It's, it's part of his um, desire and plan for us. And, um, you know, God speaks in so many different ways. You know, he, we had spoken early on in our teaching uh, different ways that God speaks prophetically just through believers. And um, you've got the... Um, feeling where you feel things some people hear god's voice it's still small voice it's kind of just like almost like their own thoughts or it's it's uh, uh god speaking to their hearts then there's feeling and um you know sometimes that's that's uh, another area welcome paul god bless you we're getting ready to get started here but uh glad you joined us tonight and Paul, I don't think you've been able to um, get the curriculum yet. So if you want to go in the chat, anyone that's on, if you want to go in the chat. I glad want to be here. I, I see I was muted. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, glad you're here. But Paul, if you want to go into the chat and, and uh, click on, um, right after my introduction, I have a PDF there. We've got a few tonight that won't, won't have... Um, curriculum to follow us our teaching but if you click on that particular pdf that is the notes of tonight's teaching but glad you're here paul amen so paul again is that what you sent me or is this different uh click on the chat you see chat at the bottom of your zoom there click on um, the chat button yep yep i'm on the side oh, i see it i see it on the file yeah so if you right click that you'll be able to download that to your desktop and follow along as you feel to or print it out or however you want to do it where are you from okay. paul uh, milwaukee wisconsin got it yeah very cool very cool yeah i've seen you a few times okay <laughs> wonderful well, i'm glad you're here amen and, and is nope. this uh, irene on or is she gonna join us tonight um, Irene is actually, I, I have another meeting that I normally do on, uh, Thursday nights. Um, uh, and I've been doing this for, for years. So, so this was a conflict. So I had to pray about whether I was supposed to be in this or whether I was supposed to be in that. Okay. And, uh, and so Irene is, is in that and okay. I'm up in her art room. So, so how does the popcorn name fit into your your uh your name and everything well um i believe i was created to help uh people with disabilities hmm. and um and when i first came to the lord um i was um uh, i was taught how to minister to people uh in the job i had and and it it, it perturbed me because you're always you're always looking for that door to open to talk to people about God and it perturbed me that I talked about sports anything I wanted at this job but I could not talk about God or Jesus they they frowned on it 
So I had this popcorn recipe, and uh, I decided to call it Pops Mana because uh, it's P-O-P apostrophe S, as in Pops Mana. Got it. Okay. And, uh, and, and he gave me the recipe. It's an awesome recipe. All right. And uh, I'm using it using it to to help out the disabled. Beautiful. I, I uh, that's a short that's a very short version of, of what it is. Someday someday I'll give you a longer version of it. No problem. Yeah. God bless you. Glad you're here. Regina, God bless you. Glad you're on tonight. Bless you and Crystal from Visalia, God bless you. DeAndre Scott, God bless you. Thank you for coming on. Brian Stokes, God bless you. I'm sure there'll be others joining here soon. But in the sake of time, we, we don't want to run out of time tonight. We're going to go ahead and dive in. So if you've got your curriculum, we are on page 240. And we're continuing talking about the five methods of prophecy. And um, if, if you want to go ahead and mute your, 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 uh, yourself, um, uh, as we get into teaching, if you'll look down at the bottom, there is where it says reactions. And if you click on the reactions, there's a option to raise your hand. And I'll click on mine just to show you what it looks like. See a little yellow raise hand there. What that helps me with is as the screen fills and if we end up getting two pages, um, I don't see everybody because I would have to try to scroll and I can't do that while I'm teaching. But if you do raise your hand, you will pop up on the first screen and I'll see you have a question. And we certainly do welcome dialogue and questions that are on the topic that we're teaching on. We certainly don't want to chase rabbits, but uh, uh, we definitely do want to receive dialogue. And so I was talking earlier about, you know, early in this, uh, we're getting close to the end of our, our semester. These semesters last six, long, six months long. And in January, we were talking about hearing God's voice. And we talked about how, you know, some people, uh, they feel things. Some people literally can hear God's voice. It's, you know, like their thoughts or it sounds like their own thoughts or God speaks to their heart. Then there's people that God speaks to through, uh, you know, uh, animation or through things in life or and you know, some people see and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, these are all the different types of, um, of how God speaks. And um, so, uh, but tonight, what we're actually talking about is not about hearing God's voice. And again, I want to make it very clear that we teach you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. And while we do believe in prophets, we do believe in apostles, we believe in the fivefold ministry as an office, but every believer can hear God's voice, should hear God's voice, and should be able to, 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 to voice that and, and share that. And so last week, we have started off with the office of the prophet, talking about the office of the prophet, how it's a headship ministry that, God has given. And again, I want to really clearly distinguish that, you know, people that prophesy and they should prophesy, they should hear God's voice and speak forth the edification, the exhortation, the comfort, the lifting up, the building up, the encouragement of the word of God. It doesn't necessarily make them a prophet. And again, we cover in the early semester part of this teaching, the, uh, Signs, the seals of what an apostle is, modern day apostle, modern day prophet. There's differences between the Old Testament and New Testament uh, prophets and things like that. But we do uh, embrace that as far as the office. But uh, the office of the prophet, and if you want to turn to your notes, we're going to begin on page 240, is a higher responsibility than the gift of prophecy. And I'm not trying to create a uh, elitism mindset because we don't really support elitism in our in, in the spirit-led family we believe everybody has a significant place and part in the kingdom of god however it's about responsibility because greater anointing and greater favor of god always results in greater responsibility and the office of a prophet is a governmental authority and role that God gives. And so because of that, um, you know, I, if, if someone comes to me at a conference or they come on uh, our spiritual, you know, our supernatural school of ministry and they say, hi, I'm, I'm John. Hi, I'm Jane. I'm a prophet. 
I, I don't um, disrespect them. And, and, you know, I just I say, well, that's wonderful. God bless you. That's great. Let's walk it out. Because there are certain signs and seals. You're either going to have it or it's not going to be there. But um, it's, it's a responsibility. So the office of the prophet is authorized, enabled, and designed to function in a higher realm of ministry than the Holy Spirit the gift of prophecy that is mainly for edification, exhortation, and comfort. And the office of the, uh, uh, the prophet has the same authority to minister to the church with preaching and prophesying as a pastor does in preaching and pastoral counseling. As I said last week, you know, much of religious order, much of denominationalism is built upon the pyramid uh, concept. And unfortunately, most denominations and most networks of religious order are pastor driven. And it's just not to disrespect or discount the importance of the office of a pastor, but many times that is a um, it's, it's a pyramid, and, and, and it, there's no room for an apostle or a prophet to flow and to operate in those settings. That's not the main reason, but one of the reasons why I stepped away in 2012 from a Pentecostal denomination uh, because of this strictures, because of this. Um, uh, um, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, Crystal's saying she can't hear me. It might just be her internet connection. If everyone can hear me, put, give me a thumbs up if I'm coming through loud and clear. I hear you, Brother Corbio. Yeah, give me a thumbs up, everybody. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, Crystal, it must be your, um, your particular uh, internet, so I'm so sorry it's coming in and out. Um, yeah. But um, anyway, um, somebody came back on. I need them to mute. There. Uh, guys, what I, the only reason why I ask you to mute, if you don't have a question, or if you ask a question, mute it, is because when we're doing the video, it, if even the slightest noise in the background, uh, the Zoom picks it up and it switches to that screen. So just if, if, if you could keep the mute, that'd be awesome, unless you have a question or a dialogue or a comment. But um, you know, we're about kingdom. Kingdom is, and I, I drew a circle and I showed you last week uh, where you got the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. They're, they're partners in the kingdom of God. They're team leaders. They work hand in hand with each other, honor, respect, honoring, preferring one another. And it's all about leading people not only into the kingdom and to Jesus, but it's also, it's about equipping and, 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 and aligning, equipping and activating people into their giftings and callings. The, the challenge with the modern day church is they have tried to accomplish apostolic ministry with a staff, with a pastor and a few paid people that came from Bible college. And, and that's, that's, you know, the settings of, of denominationalism is big platforms with chairs and whoever sit on the platform is important. And if you really want to be prayed for and really want to be touched by God, have someone from the platform come. But kingdom is not that way. That's not, that's not the way Jesus designed ministry. Jesus said, you know, these signs will follow them that believe. Uh, the, the miracles and signs and wonders follow believers. And, and again, this is not discounting the importance of the fivefold ministry leadership team and the functions they have. And, and, and certainly we should honor uh, the fivefold ministry, but it's everybody has a place in the kingdom of God. Everybody has a function that is vital and it is important. And so, you know, um, the office of the prophet, um, it, you know, in the, in the kingdom, it has the same value and authority that a pastor would. Now, if I were to say that in the years when I traveled in denominations, if I were to get in the pulpit of some pastor's church and say that, that a, a, that a prophet has the same authority to minister to the ecclesia when preaching and prophesying as a pastor does uh, with preaching or pastoral counseling, you'd be a heretic. I, I'd be run out of town because it doesn't fit in the pyramid. But, but you know, God's not really moving in denominations anymore. He may use the denomination. They may have a function, but it's really about relational 
networks and relational families. I don't even like using the word network because network usually is gathered around a personality. Networks usually gather around someone who's an influencer. And if that influencer is no longer around, the network falls apart. Whereas family is about kingdom. Family is about the things of God and, 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 and the kingdom of God is governed by family. Of course, this doesn't mean that anyone who feels called a prophet has the right to come to a church or an ecclesia and override the senior pastor's position or authority or judgments there. You'll find that you're much better received as a prophet or as an apostle if you come in with humility and you build that relationship of trust and respect first. There are many places I go and minister, and the reason why I'm able to do what I do is because I have years of relationship with this pastor or with this ecclesia or this body or, or whatever it is. And they, they know my track record. They know my ministry, how I've operated and, and it flowed for the past 40 years. And so there's a certain measure of trust and respect that comes from that. As a matter of fact, I, I will go as far as a saying, an apostle or prophet cannot function properly in any sphere of authority or any metron of authority that uh, God's called him into unless he's invited to come into that metron of authority by those that God's given authority to operate day by day in that metron. And what I'm talking about metron is where Paul in 2 Corinthians talked about your circle of influence, the influence God gives to men and women of God. And everyone's circle of influence is different. Now, the reason why I use the term influence or circle is because it thinks like this. If you were standing and you reached out and you had people standing around you, whoever you touched around you is your circle of influence. Now I'll take that to the spirit realm. Everyone has a circle of influence and some uh, circle of influence is greater and wider than others. That's why there are prophets that are called to an ecclesia, then prophets for a city or a region, then prophets for like a state or a prophet for a nation. And then of course, then prophets to nations. And that also deals with the other members of the fivefold ministry, an evangelist or an apostle and on and on. But, you know, there are some people that God's given authority in a metron. And I've learned for me to be able to step into that metron and have full freedom and authority to operate, I must be invited in by whoever God has placed there on a daily basis to operate and flow. So I hope this is making sense and, and kind of, you know, connecting the dots for some of you. But, you know, so I'm not trying to say a prophet has the authority just to come in at will, whether a pastor likes it or not. And that's never going to work. You know, you, you try walking into any modern lo uh, setting and just, I got a word from God. You know, no, you got to build a relationship first. So what I'm saying is each, each of the fivefold ministry, the pastor, the evangelist, the prophet, the apostle, the teacher, each has a special anointing and ability for unique ministry. And, and each minister are given special abilities from Christ to perfect, to equip, and to mature the saints. That's why we need the fivefold to gather together, encircling Jesus you know, you know, gathering around Jesus. You know, the problem with denomination is, here's the problem with denomination. Denomination gathers around agreement. That's why they have their manuals and their bylaws. And as long as there's agreement, then they have what they perceive to be unity. The problem is once there's disagreement, this is where splits happen where a split happens and another organization forms or another denomination forms. And so why we got so many denominations it's because there's been splits and splits and splits and splits and splits because they gather around agreement. In kingdom, we gather around Jesus. We gather around his presence. And, and, and the, the ruling factor of the kingdom is family. It is uh, that relation, relational value. I've learned as a spiritual father, I cannot bring the slightest ounce of correction or even instruction to somebody if, number one, we don't have a relationship and they trust me and I'm invited to speak into their life. Because any form of correction or even instruction in, in a person's life, especially if you came from a culture of abuse, if you came from an environment of abuse, whether it be a local church 
a pastor that dealt with you harshly or some official in an organization, then you'll view any type of instruction or correction as abuse. And, and it, it'll cause the relationship to implode and it'll cause disconnect. And I used to wonder throughout the years because, because of the anointing in my life or because of how God would use me prophetically, I would naturally draw young men and women that would say, I want you to be a spiritual father in my life. And then after about two or three months, there'd be disconnect. And I'd be like, why? And God finally showed me because proper time and attention wasn't given to developing the relationship that was needed to be able to give that type of instruction or that type of correction. And, and, and that's where a relationship comes in. Let's go back to your notes. The office functions in all the ministries of the Old Testament and New Testament, standing in the role of Christ, the prophet. Thus, a prophet's prophecies flow in the areas of guidance, instruction, yes, rebuke, but with love, judgment, and revelation, and whatever Christ chooses to speak for the purifying and perfection of his church. Now, those of you that are on the call tonight, and, and I know there's several of you that are emerging prophets, I recognize that. And uh, let me speak to you what one of the main functions of a New Testament prophet is, as opposed to the Old Testament. One of the main functions of a New Testament prophet is to see the gold in people's lives. Now, I keep referring to this, but it helps me to explain what I'm talking about. There's a show uh, on, I think it's on, um, oh, my goodness, it might be Fox. Anyway, it's, uh, no, it's not on Fox. It's, it's, it's on, um, oh, it's gone. My brain just dropped it. It's called Gold Rush. And it's, it's, it's just a, a bunch of guys that are, that are, that are they, they go in and they, they, they use these earth movers, these massive trucks with these 20 foot wheels. And, and they, 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 they'll move in a week's time, a football field or two of dirt, thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of dirt. And the whole show's around all the stuff about this, trucks breaking down and problems and things coming up, trying to keep them from getting what they call their gold go, go goal. And of course, when they get to the end of the show, they end the show, uh, Disney, that's, that's what it was on. They end the show with um, doing what's called the goal weigh-in. Now, all these thousands of tons of dirt being moved produces a little jar of gold. And this is how it is. Seeing dirt in people's life doesn't make you a powerful prophet. It makes you a misinformed prophet. And all too often in religious order, prophets are to be feared. And I, 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 I will tell you, I'm ashamed to say it. I allowed pastors to bring me in. And they would get up in front of the church and say, you better get your life straight. The prophet's here and he's going to call you out. I'm ashamed of that, that I allowed men of God to cast fear like that, because really, that's really spiritual witchcraft. Anytime you use the gifts to try to manipulate, to get people to do what you want, that spirit, that's a spirit of witchcraft, or at least it's, it's a revelation of Jezebel operating, the spirit of Jezebel. Everybody has gold in them. I don't care how much dirt you got. I don't care about your dirt. Don't, I'm not worried about it. If you really love Jesus and you're drawn into him, he'll, he'll deal with the dirt. He knows how to deal with dirt. My duty as a prophet is to help you see the gold that's in your life. It's not enough for me to see the value and the beauty of what God's getting ready to do. But I want to be able to speak the prophetic words to you that help paint a picture to you to where you see the gold. This is why I think even fivefold leaders as a whole, doesn't matter what function you're in, whether you're a prophet, a pastor, an evangelist, a teacher, if you're leading people, you need to spend more time telling people who they are than telling them what they should do or trying to fix them. Speak life into them. Speak destiny. You know, as a spiritual father, sometimes God will have you speak a person's name change. You're not Simon anymore, blown, shaking a weed in the wind. You're Peter, a rock. People need that. You don't, your destiny is not behind you. I don't care how much you messed up. I don't care what you did. That's not your destiny. Your destiny is in front of you. That's what I mean in finding the goal. 
So, continue our notes. The prophet is given special ability to know God's gifts and callings in a person's life for activating saints into their membership ministry. The prophet's perception in these areas is higher and more anointed than even those that operate in the gift of prophecy. They are very, these are the very abilities and graces of Christ. When a prophet lays hands and prophesies giftings, callings, destinies to a person, his or her words have the Christ-given capability to impart, to birth, and to activate that destiny into that person's life. How many understand what causes a season to come to an end? We all go through seasons. Seasons don't end and new seasons begin unless a prophet or an apostle imparts that. This is why you need to have men and women of God in your life that speak into your life. You know, as I was uh, uh, talking with Paul and he's known me from the past, I will have to talk some more so I can kind of play some a little bit more. I'm not sure how far in the past. If it goes back more than seven years ago, then he knew another John Arcumio and that guy's dead. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, the, the thing is that, that, that um, you know, for, when, when a season is happening in your life, God can tell you your seasons come to an end. And you can know it. But unless someone who's an anointed apostle or prophet comes and lays hands on you and decrees the new season, it doesn't get activated. It doesn't matter how many years you've been in ministry. I, I was uh, listening recently to, uh, I don't know if you all know who Chuck Pierce is from, um, He's a prophet from uh, Dallas area. And Chuck Pierce was talking about he had gone through a devastating season of financial disaster. And um, his house had got flooded and meetings got shut down. And he just went through a trial. Well, one morning he was in prayer and God spoke to him and said, your season of, of, of lack and difficulty has come to an end. Well, he had just remodeled the whole house, but he had told his wife, I am not going to put everything back up in this house. I'm not going to put stuff on the walls. I'm not going to decorate it because we're going to sell this house. And, I, and God told me we're going to sell this house. And we're, we're, we're moving out of here into a different area. And But, you know, he, he went after that prophetic word six months and nothing happened. Nothing changed. Though God prophetically told him, Chuck Pierce, your season of difficulty is ending. It was about eight months later, one morning he was sitting in his chair and he said, God, why haven't I had a shift? Why? You spoke this to me. I believe it. I'm confessing it. And God spoke to him to call another prophet friend of his. When he called his prophet friend. His prophet friend said, um, it's because you haven't released the last season and you haven't stepped in by faith into the new season. He said, I decree over you, it's time for you to take that step of faith, that act of faith, that prophetic act. And the prophetic act that was revealed to him that he needed to do was he needed to decorate his house. So to his wife, he goes, we're going to decorate this house. And boy, they went to it. And they started hanging stuff on the walls and they started putting nice furniture in. They were decorating and man, they made that house pretty. And he says when he was positioning the last picture on the wall, the phone rang. And not only was that phone call open doors of ministry, but also the next phone call was someone wanting to buy his house. And he stepped into that new season because they had been prophetically decreed over him by another prophet to make a prophetic act. Now, let me pause here and say, all of us should learn something from this. If you're somewhere and you're in your prayer time and God speaks to you something prophetically about a breakthrough, you need to start learning to do prophetic acts to show your faith in that prophetic word. Sometimes I'm prophetically speaking to an ecclesia, a group of believers, uh, sometimes I'll instruct them in prophetic acts, what to do prophetically. 
concerning um, uh, that particular work. And sometimes you need a prophetic act to break through into your prophecy. I'm going to pause here. Uh, I've, I've talked for about 15 minutes. Does anybody have any questions or if you have any things you want to add, any dialogue? I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to, to share or to ask a question. So let me add this. Let me tell you why you have to have prophetic accents. They're in your notes. It's because when a prophet comes and lays hands on you and speaks a prophetic word over you personally or over a ecclesia, if you don't receive it in faith, the, the prophecy will be birthed, but it will be a stillborn. Because the scriptures say that the, the, the word being spoken wasn't mixed with faith and it didn't profit them. This is why a man of God or a woman of God or a prophet can speak something prophetically over a person or a church and it not come to pass. It's not because they missed. There was a birthing. The word was birthed, but it was stillborn because you didn't mix your faith with it. So I challenge you do a prophetic act. Sometimes when I tell people to do a prophetic act, it's as simple as I tell everybody, I want you to stand up and we're going to take one step forward. And when we take this one step forward together, when I say one, two, three, you're going to say in Jesus' name. And it's going to release this word I spoke of you. It might be about finances. It might be about breakthrough. It might be about a marriage. Might... And sometimes that's just a prophetic act that I say to, to, to show I believe this. I'm stepping into this. So that a prophetic act may be a seed sown. God may move on you to sow somewhere in the kingdom as a result of you showing your faith that, God, I believe this. I believe what you just said. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it by faith because I'm going to sow into what I believe you just said. Amen. Amen. So, you know, um, I, I, I'm going to pause here for a second. And I'll, I'll, let's go ahead and go in, in section C. I'm going to go through that real quick. Then I'm going to, uh, I feel the Holy Spirit shift in me to talk a little bit from my heart for just a few minutes. But uh, on section C of your of your curriculum, it's, we're just going to go quickly through. I'm not going to read the scriptures. I'll let you read them on your own time. Here's some of the areas that a prophet may function in. Direction, correction, um, pr pr uh, pronouncing divine decrees of God's judgments or blessings. Move in revelation knowledge. Amen. Because you, the prophets do partake of the secrets of God. Laying foundations in the Ecclesia. Ephesians 2 and 20 tells us that. And especially the apostle prophet operates in these areas. Um, imparting spiritual gifts. Anointing minted ministries or releasing ministries. And uh, when you look in the Old Testament, the prophets anointed three ministries. Uh, King Saul was anointed by the prophet Samuel. The first high priest, Aaron, was anointed by the prophet Moses. Prophets were anointed by other prophets. Elijah anointed Elisha to step into the, his, his um, uh, ministry. Partaking in the secrets of God, another operation of the prophetic. Uh, Amos 3 and 7 tells us, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he will reveals to his servants, the prophets. Um, stir up, challenge, and bring things out of dormancy. In the people of God, um, uh, to also to, to move forward the word of God. You know, Haggai was moved to stir, stir the builders to, to, to build the wall. Um, so, again, I want to just note that uh, Jesus has set the five headship ministry gifts in the church to minister the written logos, the word, and the quickened word, which is the rhema. There's a difference. The written has been established since it was written. And it, it, the, the rhema always works within the confines of the Logos. But, you know, I believe it's important to spend as much time preparing your heart if you're going to deliver a word from God. Preparing your heart and your spirit to move and obey God as preparing to deliver 
a message or sound doctrinal teaching. And so a great key to releasing spiritual ministry is to have fivefold ministers who are willing to move in the spirit, but they're also willing to slow down, use the word of God, and to train others how to use and exercise their spiritual senses. You know, uh, when I would get ready to, to, to preach sometimes, uh, I would take time to study God's word. I would take time to, 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 to read the word, to prepare. But I also would take that time of prayer to sense, okay, God, what direction are you moving in tonight? And many times I would sense what I would call the emotions of God, how God is going to express himself that night. And there are different emotions I would feel. If I felt a real excitement and I felt just, you know, like, like this, this burning power in me, it's usually get to faith, working in miracles. There's going to be miracles at night. God's going to do great things. Um, there were times when I felt a heavy, heavy conviction or a grief because I felt God's grief over maybe a direction that Ecclesia was taking. And God had a word of, of either warning that night or sometimes it would be a convicting message. And, and God would allow me to experience these. And so um, it's important to take, spend as much time in uh, seeking the Lord for that move of the Spirit as it is to prepare in the Word of God. Now, um, I'm going to put something up that I want everybody, I want you to read this. And this is going to be something I want you to just speak out and I want you to confess this word. Uh, concerning um, God's presence, because first of all, that's what we're all about. We're about the presence of God. But um, these are declarations I want you to make, because as we do our prophetic rooms, and we're going to be inviting those of you to come when we do our rooms, to come in and to begin to speak that thought from the throne or whatever God's given to you, and want you to exercise your prophetic gift. We want you to, to, to have confidence that you hear from God. So I'm going to post real quick on the screen here. And I want everybody, uh, I want you to read um, what I'm getting ready to uh, uh, put here. So I want you all to read this. I want to read this together. Okay. Let's begin with verse one. Let's read this together. Can everyone see this? Okay. If you can see, okay, put your thumbs up. If you can see the, the screen, uh, just fine. Good, good, good. Yeah. Let's read the first line. My first ministry is to God. No matter how I feel, I worship with joy and passion because of who he is. You know what? For effect, let's just have everybody unmute yourself. I know it's going to be chaos, but that's all right. Everybody just go ahead and unmute yourself. Got a quiet crew tonight. I don't mind you being quiet, but uh, we, we want you to feel like you can be part so, um, so we got someone that was here and they've left the room. <laughs> you got to love Zoom. So if, if, you, if you're able to unmute, we invite you to unmute. Okay, let's all read this together. Let's read number one again together. You ready? Let's read it. My, My first, first ministry, ministry to, God. to God is to God. No matter, no matter how, how I feel. feel. I worship, I worship, I worship with joy, joy and passion, and passion because, of because of who he is. Because of who he is, I easily I connect, connect with his presence. With his presence, presence no, no, what, no, matter no matter what, what I'm doing, I'm doing going throughout, throughout my day, my day. God, delights in me. God delights in me and me wants, wants to be with me 24-7. I am hungry for I'm hungry more of God, hungry for more of God manifest presence. presence. I am, I am near to God, near to God. God. and He is near to me. I do not allow anything to come between me and God. I am a world changer. I am a world changer because of the Holy Spirit present in my life. Every time I worship, I am transformed more and more into the image of Christ. Amen. 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 So I'm, I'm going to talk into now about the levels of influence, the levels of influence, because, you know, I have people that come to me and they come to a conference or they call me and they want a one time 
prophetic word by Zoom or by the phone, and they expect their lives to become changed because of that one prophetic word. So I'm going to throw a graphic up here that um, I want you all to see while I talk about this. But um, these are the levels of anointing. Now, every person has a level of anointing. And I will tell you right now, anointing, you know, grace, salvation comes by grace. There are things that you can just claim in the word of God because God says it. You know, I'll supply your every need or, or you know, give us this day our daily bread. And you can just claim that. You can speak it. But the things in your life and ministry that God has promised you, your destinies, your assignments, you have to contend for that. All right. So here are the levels. Okay. Um, when you're a leader and you're influencing people, you've got three different levels of people. You've got first the crowd. These are people that they just want a one-time experience. I'll invite them to come to these Zoom uh, lessons and they'll attend one or two. And, and, and they'll think that just do one or two lessons, they're going to get my anointing. They're going to get, you know, uh, an impartation from my life. And, and, you know, the challenge is, yes, they're hungry. They're hungry for the assignment that you have. They want to be used in the prophetic. And, um, you know, um, but it, it, they're, they're limited to how much anointing they could receive because after a, a week or two weeks, they're off chasing someone else. They're off joining someone else's, uh, you know, prophetic thing because they just want to get a full, you know, snatch here, a bite from this person, a bite from this person. And, 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 and the problem with that is you cannot influence and affect people on a continual basis. You cannot affect them unless you spend time with them. It's like God. To know God's voice, you got to spend much time with him. You can't just have snatches of prayer here and there, five minutes here, 10 minutes there, praying on the way to work and just doing it on the run. There are times you got to spend time in his presence, just soaking. Sometimes Jennifer and I will spend an entire morning, three hours, just soaking, just worshiping. Just sitting and resting and praying and seeking God. Then you got the community or the disciples, those that are, that are being affected by you. They have a little bit more of a um, connection with you. They're connected with your vision. Not only are they connected, but they invest into uh, your life. And they're going to have a little bit more of the poor, of the level of anointing coming in your life. Then there's the core. The core is the inner circle. That's sons and daughters. This is a deep, committed relationship. This is why when I get people that come to me and they, they write me or they call me and they say, um, they say that, um, <clears throat> that uh, you know, you know, you know, a lot of people call me Papa John. Papa John, I want you to be a spiritual father in my life. And I'm like, well, that's wonderful. That's great. Let's walk it out. What I'm saying is, are you going to be able to make it from the crowd to the community and into the core? To be a spiritual son there's a, or a daughter, there's a deep commitment involved there. There's a deep connection. And it's where that gift in you becomes stirred up. So I, I wanted to share this because a lot of people don't understand. You know, they're like, you know, yeah, I, I, I went to, you know, John R. Cook, you know, the conference that John R. Cook had, and they think that in that one two-day conference, they're going to get everything they need. You might get inspired. You might get touched. You might get a word from God. But to really be impacted, you have to be able to spend time and to connect. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this for you leaders, the people that you're leading. People that you're influencing. Not everybody gets the same level of your anointing. You love everybody. You'll have a coffee with whoever wants to have a coffee with you. 
But I can always tell when someone, they get that certain look in their eyes. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, you know I want what you have. I don't care. You know, it's kind of like Elijah. Elijah's like, Elijah tried three times to shake Elisha. Carry here while I go to, to, to Gilgal. No, you go to Gilgal. I'm going to Gilgal. Okay. Terry here. Wait, I'm going to Bethel. No, you're going to Bethel. I'm going to be. You ain't shaking me. You know, I had a uh, men of God in my past that they would test me like Billy Cole would do stuff just to try to offend me because God sometimes lets your mind be offended to reveal your heart. <laughs> And I would be literally upset. I'd have to leave his presence, go into my hotel room, get my pillow, and oh! I'm so mad. Why is he doing this? And God's like, he's testing you. You see how serious you are. Well, I was like a bulldog. You ain't shaking me. <laughs> I get my spirit right, and I say, okay, Lord. Now, I've learned I'll never treat sons that the way he does. I don't want to disrespect Billy Cole, but any on this call who knew William H. Cole, <laughs> he was old school rough. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, and, and I would never treat a son or a daughter in some of the ways men who shaped me treated me. But the process was, you know, you, you've got to have some stickability. This is a challenge I have. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but like the millennial generation. Oh, my goodness. Help me, Jesus. I mean, they literally think one coffee at Starbucks is it. And they can walk out of there and start calling you Papa. You're my father. <laughs> and, you know, I've seen guys on, on YouTube getting on talking about, you know, John R. Cub is my spiritual father. I'm like, who the heck is that? I'm sorry for my French there, but what? <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw that guy at a pastry shop. <laughs> he got a drop of my anointing, you know. But it's just like, you know, they want everything fast and, and, and microwaved and, and instant. And, and the second you start getting into their life, you start getting close to them. You, you give a little bit of correction to them in love. And all of a sudden, their cell phone stops ringing. <laughs> they just poof. They ghost you. <laughs> you just They're gone. <laughs> Oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm venting a little bit. I don't know. But I just, you know, there, there is a certain dynamic. And, and I'm talking about that special relationship because you know, even Jesus, Jesus had the crowd he ministered to. He ministered to thousands. And he loved doing that. Then he had 70 that, that was connected to him. Then he had 12 that was more his core. That's who he spent the crux of his time with, pouring into them, loving on them and correcting them and helping them and being a true, a true father. And then even in the 12, he had three, mm -hmm. Peter, James, and John. Uh, sweetheart, is there something you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I was going to just say that he had the three that he took up to see the um, transfiguration, remember? Yes. Yeah. Not, not all of them could go. Yeah. And you wonder why that was. Why did he cho choose those three and the other ones had to stay back? And one of the hardest things, the most heartbreaking things I've had to learn to do as a spiritual father is to let sons go. Now, let me tell you what I think is the main reasons for what I would call spiritual disconnect between fathers and sons because sometimes you know spiritual disconnect happens and you know i don't like it but sometimes it happens and so let me um 
let me just look real quick because I might be able to, to post something here. Um, well, can I say something? Go ahead, baby. You, you know, we had somebody that wanted to come under our ministry, but she changed. She changed. Um, uh, how do I say this? Um, she changed apostles or mentors. However, she, she viewed us like, I mean, I don't know how many she went through. Remember? Well, the thing is, if you are a, if you are a um, leader of any kind, you have to endure, whether you're a pastor, any area of leadership, you're going to, deal with a certain measure of disconnect of people that's just going to fire you. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's all I could, that's the only way I could describe it is, you know, all of a sudden one day they're not attending anymore. They're not, because it's, it's the orphan spirit. It, it's the, um, you know, we, 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 we live in a, 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 a generation of an orphan spirit and, you know, fathers and mothers have to deal with this, because orphans live in a stage of disconnect. They're always disconnecting and finding a new apostle, a new prophet. Every six months, they got a new apostle in their life, a new spiritual father. And, 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 and in fact, the orphan spirit, if it's not dealt with, won't allow you to join a family of God. And, and you know, because orphans have to be right. They have to be recognized. They have to be first. You know, these are things that, that orphans you know, um, you know, have to deal with and, 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 and let God deal with it in, in their heart and in their life. But several things I just want to say, um, I, was, I was hoping I could put some notes up for you to, to follow, but I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding uh, that actual slide. But anyway, um, the, the key to it is, Number one, I, I do my best to not criticize. If, 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 if there's a spiritual son that, that comes into my ministry, into my life, you know, because I do operate as an apostolic father, I have the tendency, and I see your hand, Ken, and I'm going to get to you in just, just one second. Um, I, 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 you know, part of an apostle's anointing is to set things in order. And when I see someone's life out of order, you know, I have to resist the tendency to want to come in too quickly and to fix them without having that relationship with them. That will cause disconnect. If I don't build a relationship and show them I love them and that I'm for you and I'm for your future and for your destiny. And, and um, I don't think he's on tonight, but one of my sons in the gospel, uh, is Michael on tonight? I don't think he is. But one of my sons in the gospel, and I, don't, and I know he wouldn't mind me saying this. It took Michael and I a year one solid year of having coffees or teas once a week before he finally dropped his guard to receive me as a spiritual father. And during that time, God would not let me correct him in the least bit. And, he, and he'll even admit there were things in his life that needed correction, but I hadn't developed that relationship yet. Uh, and, and make the second point, Ken, and I'll get to your, your question. The second point is, you know, um, if, if either the father or the son start looking too closely at each other's faults and flaws, you know, I'm not Jesus. Newsflash, <laughs> not perfect. The challenge is most ministries learn to live so far above people that they learn to have this persona that they put forth of perfection, of flawlessness. But then in their natural life, they only let a few people into their life. That's where they really live. And that's just unfair to live that way and to be that way. I tell people, if you, if you can't handle my humanness, then you're not going to be able to receive the anointing God has to pour into your life. Because I'm not going to try to fake it till you make it. But not only does a son shouldn't look too close to a spiritual father, but a spiritual father should not look too closely to the son's faults and flaws. 
And especially if the Holy Spirit's not telling you to, to deal with it, just love them. Love them and d- just leave it alone. The time will come. You'll be able to work with that and deal with that. But don't become too preoccupied with changing someone and trying to fix them. You know, I had a, a gentleman that, that came to a conference and he, he said, God told me, God spoke to me that you're to be my spiritual father. And I'm like, okay, well, let's walk it out. And so I set up some lunches, a coffee and a couple of lunches to talk with him. By the second lunch, we're sitting there over lunch and he crosses his arms and says, God has revealed to me through, through discernment that you got issues in your life and I'm here to straighten you out. <laughs> we never had the third lunch, <laughs> you know, just because it's going to cause disconnect. Okay, uh, Ken, go ahead and, and ask your question, sir. So, and maybe this is a little bit of the prophetic in me. This ask one that need him an answer to this question. Would you say that the difference between what you're referring to as a disconnect and a spirit of rejection to you as a spiritual father depends on the relationship to begin with? Because you can't really feel necessarily rejected unless there's relationship to begin with. So would you say that in order as a spiritual father, what would keep you from feeling either rejected or just a spirit of rejection trying to oppress you would be the depth of the relationship with that person to begin with. Well, Ken, let me be very honest with you. I operated many years in my ministry as an orphan. I had an orphan heart. And most religious people get offended if you start talking to them about an orphan heart. Because then they start listening to you all their accomplishments. I've written seven books. I've traveled to nations. I preach. I serve as assistant pastor in my church. I'm a Sunday school director. I'm, um, you know, all these different things. And and Matthew, I see your question, and I'm going to answer your question in a second. Yes, sir. Because it actually is something I'm moving towards to talk about. And they begin to say, how can I be an orphan? I've been filled with the Holy Spirit for 30 years. I'm doing all these works. The challenge is organizations are full of orphans. In fact, organizations are a great place for orphans to to, to, to be, to exist. I I am convinced that many organizations are just orphanages. (laughs) It's all orphans unite, come together. And, And, you know, so... I, I'm going to show this real quick to some of you um, just so you can understand um, uh, the difference. Now, while I'm pulling this up, I'm going to tell you that there's a difference in like the graphic I showed you. I influence people. I influence thousands. That's one level. Then there's mentorship. Mentorship is great. Where I come alongside someone for a season. There was never intended for there to be a father-son relationship. The whole reason was that person was to come alongside me for a season. Three months, six months, a year, two years. And to mentor them. That's like in, 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 you know, high school. You know, in ninth grade, you have a teacher trained at time and then when the year comes to end that teacher departs and then God then another teacher comes in the next year to teach something else and there are mentors God brings in and out of your life that's not disconnect but it's when God divinely reveals both to a spiritual father and to a son that I put you together that's a covenant relationship it's sacred and when God brings that together no one has a right to break that except God when I have spiritual fathers in my life, and I, I still have a spiritual father that speaks into my life, God put that person there. I have no right to step away. I don't care if he hasn't called me in three years. God put that there. But yes, there's got to be a healing take place in your heart, Ken. And um, that healing um, has to be in, inward, because if, especially if you were hurt 
by a father figure. You're going to, it's not if, but when you're going to carry that hurt over to someone who starts speaking into your life as a spiritual father. So let, let me just real quick share this with you guys. And, um, you know, just, just what the role of a spiritual father really is. Okay. The role of a spiritual father is to raise up a son spiritually. Now, this is different from a mentor. A father nurtures and protects a son. The spiritual father pours out knowledge, understanding, wisdom, counsel, and blessings to the son. A father's primary goal is to make the son successful in knowing the Lord and fulfilling the call of God that's on that son or daughter's life. Please don't think because I'm saying sons, I'm dismissing daughters. Spiritual fathers enjoy spending time with their sons and daughters, not out of obligation because they are truly family and you just enjoy being with them. You can let your hair down. Fathers who are controlling many times are not fit to be spiritual fathers because that spirit of control in their life would not allow them to get close to that son or daughter to affect them. So fathers must allow access in their life. I grew up in a denomination that did not have very many fathers. You know, Paul said it. There's not many spiritual fathers. He said, no, I am your father. But it's because a lot of men don't want to allow access. They don't want you to have access into their life. But that's what it means to be a spiritual father and influencer. You will give access to people. You'll allow people to have access to your life. It's like you're sitting at the table and you're eating a steak on your plate. Your sons and daughters have a right to your plate. They can take a fork and a knife and lean over and cut a piece of steak for themselves and eat it. Because they're a son and they're a daughter. It's a special covenant relationship. So Jesus was the perfect example of a spiritual father. Hebrews 2 and, 2 and verse 13. Jesus called himself to those sons who God ordained for him and appointed to be with him. That's Mark 3 verses 13 to 14. He gave spiritual sons access to him every day. His sons didn't have to go through his secretary in order to schedule a time to talk to Jesus. They had direct access to him whenever they wanted, as a true family does. Jesus' son never felt they were bothering him with questions because they had an open door to commune with him. I'm going to stop for a second because I want, I want to really drive this point home. I've had people tell me, oh, so-and-so is my spiritual father. And there's no access. And I've had to tell them, I'm sorry. I don't want to discourage you. I'm not here to, to disrespect you. But that is not a spiritual father. That is a mentor. And it's fine to have mentors. I have a mentor in California, uh, Che An. I speak to him once every six months. That's it. So he's not a spiritual father to me. He's a mentor. But he's very valuable. And I glean a lot from the media he puts out. I'm always gleaning from what he's teaching and sharing and giving because we have the same heart in so many areas. But, you know, this is the main difference. Spiritual fathers allow for access. Let's continue. I want to keep, keep talking on this. Now, some leaders who claim to be spiritual fathers but do not respond to emails or phone calls for days or weeks, that can be damaging to a spiritual son if he's truly a spiritual son. Jesus understood this. Jesus cared about his sons and spent time with them. Any father who does not spend time with his son or daughter is not a real spiritual father. They want to call themselves fathers, but they're not really a father. Jesus cared greatly about the spiritual needs of his sons. He invested time into them so they'd be successful. He gave them wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and he taught them about God. He demonstrated to his sons how to do ministry. He trained them. He raised them up. He empowered them. Then he gave them power and authority to do ministry and his platform to preach. I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, this is one thing that I really want to emphasize. When you are a spiritual father or you're a spiritual mother and God gives you a platform, 
What do you mean by plat- platform? I'm talking about a space where you can speak to people and influence them, whether it be social media, whether it be an actual ecclesia somewhere, maybe it's a training center or a church or a conference or, or whatever, to where God is extending to you a platform to influence people. You are required by God as a spiritual father and a spiritual mother to share that platform with sons and daughters. It never ceases to amaze me. The insecure leaders, they will not give their sons and daughters the mo- one moment of time, whether it be pulpit time to preach, teach, share, prophesy. And they guard it because they're thinking that they're, they're going to knock me off my perch of greatness. Well, buddy, if you're that easily knocked off your perch of greatness, then that's not greatness in the kingdom of God. Because apostles, spiritual fathers and mothers, they are called by God to lay their lives down. You're literally laying the mud so sons and daughters can walk across your back mm-hmm. to their destinies. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I pray to God we have a transformation yes. in the Ecclesia that these leaders who are not true spiritual mothers and fathers will get a clue. Yes. Start realizing that influence and that favor and all that big money and power that God gave them is not for them. It is for those that God has called them to serve and to lift and to build. Right. I apologize. I'm getting excited. But this is a passion for me because we have a generation of fatherless sons and daughters because insecure leaders don't want to share the limelight. Someone else's light starts shining a little bit brighter than them. They find a reason to disconnect. You got to leave. God forbid they feel like they need to go across town and start a church. They'll be blasted from the pulpit the very next Sunday. Oh, they're an Absalom. Don't don't talk to them. They had nothing to do with them. You called that a son? And you're going to disconnect and reject them that fast? Our leaders need to repent of arrogance and selfishness and self-promotion and recognize the platforms that God has given to them. Their sons and daughters have a right to it. All right. Jesus demonstrated to his sons how to do ministry. He trained them. He, He raised them up and empowered them. He gave them power and authority to do ministry Amen. False spiritual fathers rarely ever share their platform. If they do, it's always controlled. I'm sorry. They may require a son to give them a detailed account of the message before they're allowed to preach it. Tell me the full word. You know, it's like right now there's this, there's this thing going on in that Ecclesia where these, these, they're trying to establish apostles and leaders that prophets have to come to. And tell them the word first. Now they'll decide if it goes out on media and goes out to the world. Now I believe in accountability. We need accountability, but not control. Not manipulation and domination. So the wannabe spiritual father may tell a son what to preach in the pulpit. Instead of allowing that son and training him or her, that daughter, to hear from the Lord, to preach what the Lord is telling them. This is control. When Jesus sent his sons out, he did not tell them where to preach. He simply said, go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. False spiritual fathers allow a son to take their platform on a rare occasion, but they'll never fully give their sons an inheritance. They only give the pulpit up out of obligation rather than genuine love and genuinely wanting that son to succeed because true spiritual fathers believe in sons and daughters. Jesus believed in the ones who no one else believed in. He took the ones who didn't make the cut 
the cut of formal ministry training. And he transformed them into some of the greatest ministers in the history of mankind. A true father believes in his sons and daughters and gets the best out of them. He gets the best out of them because he treats them from the best. One of Jesus' main priorities was not building his own ministry, but building others. See, Jesus worked diligently to see the life of God established in others. This can only be done out of a deep, personal, intimate relationship. And any father that's unwilling to spend time with sons and daughters is not a father at all. See, Matthew 23, 1, 1 through 12 tells us, and, I, and I'll let you read the whole scripture yourself, but paraphrasing it, fathers who don't put forth the effort to spend time with their sons are nothing more than fakes. And they just want the title of father, like a Pharisee, without truly empowering sons and daughters. Not only do fathers equip and train sons and daughters, but they release them into ministry, even though they don't think they're fully mature. You know, they were still arguing about who's the greatest, and Jesus released them in the ministry. Now, character and Christ likeness are important and necessary. And there must be a certain level of ministry attained. But Jesus understood that if you had to be perfect to be in ministry, then no one will be in ministry. He knew this group of sons would abide in God until they attained spiritual maturity. Therefore, he trusted them with ministry, even though they had faults and flaws. See, controlling leaders can never trust sons with ministry. These fathers will always overlook their own faults, but clearly see the faults of sons and daughters. They justify that the spiritual sons and daughters are not ready for ministry yet. And of course, if these fathers have a son in the natural, that son will be ready for ministry in their own eyes. It's because false spiritual fathers do things according to the flesh and not the spirit. Jesus treated his sons as though they were more mature than they really were. And by doing this, he brought them into a greater level of ministry. Of course, it goes without saying to be a true father, you got to first be a son or a daughter. You see, sons and daughters mature rapidly because they're treated with respect and they're trusted. Controlling or false spiritual fathers do not have the ability to treat sons and daughters as though they are mature. They talk down to their sons and daughters. They make them feel low and insignificant. Sons can never get it right in their eyes. False fathers don't have the capacity to treat their sons with respect. They do, however, require that the son honor them and treat them always with respect. But they don't know how to be a father because they've never learned to be a son. Jesus trusted his sons. He gave Judas the responsibility of overseeing the money. Jesus, Judas, Jesus could have placed two of his other sons in charge of collecting and counting and distributing, but he didn't. He trusted Judas, who he knew was a thief. He even knew that Judas would betray him, but he put trust in him. This is a remarkable leadership quality that's extremely hard for us to understand. The controlling spiritual father has a hard time trusting even the most honest spiritual son. One of the focuses that Jesus had was to see God's destiny come to pass in his spiritual sons. He believed and supported his sons so God's will could be accomplished through them. The controlling false spiritual father will only be concerned about his own vision. He may say he cares about the vision God wants to accomplish through his sons, but he really doesn't. This kind of father is only interested in getting sons to serve his vision and ministry. The controlling father does not want to release spiritual sons into their own ministries because he needs slaves to serve his ministry. This is, of course, because his calling, of course, is more important. So Jesus counseled his sons so he could be leaders and spiritual fathers themselves. And you can see that in Luke 22, where he taught the principle of servanthood. According to Jesus, the greatest leader or spiritual father would be servant of all. Jesus came serving his sons. His sons didn't serve him. He served them 
in a far greater capacity than they could ever serve him. And Jesus gave them everything. As we've already discussed, he gave them power, authority, knowledge, anointing, a platform, released them into ministry. Compared to how much Jesus served them, really his son served him very little. The greatest among them was servant of all. And of course, the greatest was clearly Jesus. And this was the example he led. Many false leaders or spiritual fathers exercise a seat of authority in a lordship position. They'll never openly say that, but the air in their congregation is permeated with the sense everyone needs to serve this leader. It's all about this leader's vision. Sons need to serve this father's vision. The problem with this type of thinking is it's the opposite of what Jesus taught. He taught that you to serve everyone else. Jesus said that the one who governs the church must become the servant. Let me pause here and say, you know, a lot of what I'm teaching you right now, this goes against the grain of a religious order. This will never be taught in a, in a conference of a denomination somewhere because man has made what I call factory church or factory organization God, where the organization rules. Everyone is here to serve the almighty organization. Nobody's important. The organization matters. The church matters. The house. That's not the way Jesus did ministry. When we're going to wake up and go back and look at what Jesus did and realize, maybe this is why we're in the mess we're in, in the church in America. That's why God's calling out an ecclesia. And this ecclesia, this kingdom, is being led by true spiritual mothers and fathers that are servants at heart. They're not there to use men and women to serve their ministry. And if you've put your time in, I know ministers that if if Jesus came tomorrow, they would get the golden briefcase award from him. That's all they've done is carried the bishop's briefcase for 15 years, carried his Bible, filled his water. This dynamic, This dysfunctional, unbiblical representation of spiritual fathers must be replaced with true fatherhood. So let me wrap this up. I wasn't planning on doing all this, but I'm going to finish it out since I I did start it. The problem with any thinking is, you know, Jesus said that the one who governs the ecclesia must become the servant. Now, this doesn't mean that the governor should require everyone to serve him and and build his ministry. It means that the governor uses his power and authority to empower people into their God-given callings. True fathers equip, they train, and they release. That's what Ephesians 4 and 12, 4, 11 through 13 tells us. It doesn't say that the leader is to perfect, equip the saints for the building up of the work of his, of his own ministry. It says the saint is called to be a part. And they may be part of that leader's ministry or they may not. That's not you as a leader to worry about. You as a leader, as a father, obey Christ in the scriptures, serve, perfect, train, and empower, and then release people into the ministry. Not your ministry. Because a true father wants their son or their daughter to succeed and to go farther even than they went. And when you seek that relationship, and and Ken, this is probably an answer to your question. As you begin to have intimacy with God, as you draw near to God, Ken, God's going to heal your heart from father wounds. And true sons will serve their father. But that service isn't based on relationship Excuse me, that, that is based on relationship. It's not requirement. You see, required service is always heavy and burdensome. When service is done on our friendship, it's an easier yoke to bear. Jesus called his sons to be in relationship with him before he ever expected them to serve. Many pastors or leaders won't even consider spending time with someone unless they first serve their ministry for a season. 
I mean, they don't allow you to fit in their church until you prove that you're willing to serve. You, you'll have no place unless you give a lot of money or you show up and, and you, you're, you're rolling your sleeves up. Is that how Jesus operated? Is that how the love of God is? Here's how Jesus got his sons to serve him faithfully. He established relationship with them. So whether it's sons serving fathers, fathers serving sons, relationship is the foundation. And my friends, that is kingdom. Questions? Comments? Let's wrap up with some dialogue. I've been teaching too much. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, yes. yes, Brother Arcovio, I had a question for you. What if uh, you're in a place where there's not uh, a lot of that type of relationship? In other words, what if you're in a place that's dominated by the pyramid mindset? What advice would you have in that type of scenario? Get out. <laughs> Find a place that's kingdom. You can't bolt this to existing religious order. Apostolic principles, kingdom principles can't be bolted onto religious order. You have to find a family, a place that you belong. Paul, was, what, you want to add something? Go ahead, Paul. I was just wondering, I mean, how can, if you have a congregation of so many believers, how can you possibly father that many? You don't. You recognize, again, the levels. You, get, you got the crowd, the, the core, and then spiritual sons and daughters. So naturally, it's going to be those that are drawn to you through relationship. And I am convinced that sons don't choose fathers. Fathers choose sons. The scriptural reference for that is Elijah. Elisha was out plowing. Elijah is the one that came and cast his mantle on him. And walked away and basically by his actions was saying, come follow me. Because Elijah was like, let me go home and say goodbye to my father and mother. Do a barbecue with these oxen and I'm coming. So I'm very cautious about letting people choose me to be a spiritual father. Because a lot of times that just ends bad. There's just that witness where I just, God puts a love in my heart for someone. And, and then what I'll do is I'll, have, I'll ask to have a coffee with them. And I won't tell them. God showed me that you, you, I'm to pour into you as a son or a daughter. Instead, I just let them talk. And, and, and eventually it comes to that point where they're like, um, can I spend more time with you? Can I have coffee with you like once a week? Well, well i got to face it, Paul, and wouldn't you admit with this? You can unmute yourself. Everyone can unmute yourself. I don't care. We're, we're on dialogue now, so you don't have, you don't have to re-mute, re-mute yourself. I just want everybody to be free to ask a question if you want to without having to worry about unmuting yourself. So, But, um, Paul, you know, here's the thing. One thing we got to recognize as humans, you and I only have so many hours in a day to share. Okay? By the time we take care of things in life, we have to – family, uh, work, or doing business, or even the work of the kingdom, you know, we, we may only have to spare a few hours each day. And, 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 and that becomes even tighter the more responsibility you receive as a leader. So, yes, you have to become, you know, I'm not saying this to be arrogant. But I'm very careful who I give the greatest of my oil to. I don't pour the greatest of my oil on someone who's just a casual you know, as, as yours probably does, my Facebook goes off every day. Somebody from Pakistan, Africa, India, you know, all over America, past people who knew me, present people just discovering me. And, and I'm very cautious who I give my time to. And it's just when I really sense it's somebody that God's put in my heart, then I'll ask for a uh, time to, to break bread together and just talk a little bit more with them because they may not be ready for a spiritual father. And if they're not ready, then it's not time yet. But no, if, if you're, you know, I believe it goes back to what was, was maybe called the Jethro principle. I think that's where you as a leader should be spending time to raise up 10 or 12 spiritual sons and daughters that can care for the, the main body. And so I would say out of a, 
a church that runs 300, you may have, you know, out of 300 as a crowd, you might have 30 there that are quality leaders that you're sowing into. You're taking time to, to teach them each week or time to sow into them and you're mentoring them. But then out of that 30 people, you might have a dozen, maybe 10. Because I no, don't it's know, just... you know, it, it's, when someone tells you they have 100 sons, I say they're not true sons. Right. Nobody I... can physically care for 100 sons at one time. Impossible. Right. right. I wasn't, I was just curious because yeah. of what I was raised in. I'm, I'm not, that's really not my calling at all. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not. Good question. Um, no, great question. No, I was just curious. Yeah. And I, and when I get really intense, I'm not going at you. I'm just. I'm no, no, no. I, I can get really intense. Too. I hear these guys. <laughs> they're like, yeah, I got 300 sons. And the problem is their sons they haven't seen in 10 years. So, sure. you know, I, I think honestly, true sons. Jesus could have called 30. Don't you agree? Amen. Not you had to agree, everybody. He could have called fifty. He, he could have handled a thousand. He called twelve, <laughs> and he was God in flesh. Right. So I, I don't think I could handle more than twelve sons and daughters, true, bona fide. That if they need me, if they're in trouble, I drop everything I'm doing and I'm there. But that's a special. I mean, that, that takes a lot to enter that type of covenant. Couldn't that kind of be comparative to the difference between the 12 and the 70? Yeah. The 70 I mean, would be mentorship. Yeah. Or even the 500. Right. They, because, they, yeah, the 500 were, were, were dedicated to Jesus. Because, you know, you have the election, of, you know, which is, and the Bible even says that creation eagerly waits to see the manifestation of the sons of God. So I think that it takes time and for a son to be manifested. So, so to say, how can I find the time to take care of a hundred sons? You're probably only going to influence her father, um, you know, up to a dozen people or so as a father. But then when they're grown and in the ministry, you kind of expect that maturity to where there may be some time that goes by before you talk to them, like, you know, once a year or whatever, but God's going to constantly have that recycling of sons going right. through. And Ken, what I just want to say is it doesn't mean I don't, as, as a father, you don't give your time to people. Right. I, I give Absolutely. my time to people that I don't consider to be sons. You know, if I have it to give, I'll give it, but I reserve my best for the sons and daughters. And I make that clear to them. And I say, In look, fact, Look, I don't want you thinking, don't you ever call me on the phone and say, I, I apologize, Papa John. I know you're busy. I will rebuke you because you have access to me. If you need me, you call me. It's the difference between what you and I have been throughout our history. You know, like, I mean, I, I've, I know I've always been able to talk to you at conferences, at churches, when you're, you know, you know, for the Arcovio, I was reading The Way of the Eagle, or I was reading The Mantle of God, you know, and I had a question about the, that's a mentor, but that wasn't sitting down like it is now actually getting direct input into my yes. life. We're definitely developing. So that's a difference. We're definitely developing a much deeper relationship. I'm just, you know, I know you're, you're probably going to come for Eagle Summit, but I'm just looking forward to the time to sit down and break bread. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm coming this summer, brother. <laughs> already told my wife. Give me coming a, a couple of times. Give us a heads up because we're getting busy. We're, 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 we're going to be flying out a few times and doing some ministry. So oh, I will. Make sure you let us know. Oh, I will. Absolutely. Yeah. But let me say this. Back to Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't allow the 12 to choose him. Would everyone, would everyone agree me on, with me on that? Mm -hmm. That agreement? And not only did Jesus choose the 12, but he chose it as led by the Spirit. Because right. he spent the night in prayer before he chose the 12. So what it means is spiritual sons are chosen by God. I've had people who I dearly loved. And I thought, man, I'd love to be a spiritual father to that person. But God never allowed that relationship to come together. He never directed it. Because that's not my choice. That's Papa's choice. And so, but Jesus 
ministered constantly to the 70 and to the 500. And what's amazing to me is, you know, I, I've seen a lot. And when I stepped away from denomination, I started connecting with all kinds of groups. And I discovered, I don't care what you call yourself. You could call yourself Assembly of God. You can call yourself Church of God in Christ, Church of God Cleveland. You can call yourself Southern Baptist. You can call yourself Charismatic, non-denominational. You can call yourself Apostolic Brethren. All, everything still ends up in the pyramid. And the pyramids is horrible to relationships. You got to get rid of the pyramid. And... I know I was at one, uh, I spent a little time with an apostle from El Paso and, you know, he'd have a conference every year and there'd be young men that would come up and they would say, God moved on me. I've been saving money all year. And they'd come and lay $20,000 at the apostle's feet. And, 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 and what bothered me was he wasn't using this to bless the kingdom. He was buying his children to be in W's and he was just, you know, and, and I just like, no, 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 time out. But what ended up happening was whoever paid the most money into his ministry became a son. It's like the, the cost of <laughs> sonship. And when you look at Jesus, there were people throughout the scriptures that took care of him financially, that sowed into him. He didn't make them a disciple because that was a, that was a spiritual-led thing. He spent the night in prayer and the Holy Spirit directed him. Go ahead, baby. Yeah, I see your hand. Um, <laughs> I, I was just thinking about how many, how many followed Jesus just because of all the signs and wonders that he did. Well, was, what I'm saying is even with Jesus, you know, the different ones that were wealthy that poured into his and blessed him, like Joseph of Arimathea, Mary of Magdalene. There's different ones that were wealthy people that really helped Jesus and poured into him so he could do what he would, could do. Right. He give them extra preferential treatment. That was the Spirit's directing. And, 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 Jesus, and we remember how it, Jesus said, I chose you. You didn't choose me. And see, this is where it's so hard to deal between kingdom and people coming out of the nomination. Of course, I try to have compassion and give them time to adjust to kingdom principles. But I've had people come in and they think because they write that $5,000 check, God told me to give this to you. They're expecting me to do something special for them, put them on the platform, special seat. I honor them, but I don't treat them any different than someone over here. And it offends some people because they're used to that in religious order. Mm -hmm. I have to have compassion with them and spend time with them and say, look, that's not kingdom. Papa would not be pleased with me if I gave you special preferred treatment because you gave an offering. You told me you gave that because God told you. I don't want to take your reward away. If I put you on a platform or I put some special thing and you got a special position with me, I just took your eternal reward away. You got your reward. When you give as according to obedience to God, your reward is in heaven. Anyone else? This is a great dialogue. Anyone else want to? Well, I, I just want to finish my thought here that, you know, many followed him just because of what he could do. How many really sat at his feet? How many really wanted to get to know him? And that's the same that goes with, with many leaders. Well, I checked your Facebook out, uh, Brother Arcovio, and you've got thousands of people following you. I'd like to get to know you, you know. Where are you going to, where's your next meeting at so I can go and watch you? And, and all they want is, is, is to be, get part of what, who you are, just to be able to, to get some doors open to them. They're not really interested in being in a relationship with you. They just want to know how far you'll take them. And, and you know, that's a great point, Jennifer. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Because this goes back to relationship. You know, yes, we're called to serve and to honor and to love the people of God. But if a person is not willing to enter the relationship, then you really can't get the anointing. It's just the principle God established. So, so yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's a tough, tough turn to get people to make the turn into relational 
connection, family of God. You belong, you know, you know, and, and people always slide back into what they came out of. And there's got to be a deliverance from that mindset. And Ken, that's kind of what you were saying, you know, and I, and I believe for you, Ken, you're going to come to a place where your heart becomes healed because God healed my heart. God brought me to a place through intimacy with him and just a love relationship, the divine romance, that the time I spent in his presence transformed me and God healed me from having an orphan heart to where I could, you know, receive instruction and correction. Even though, yes, I've traveled the world and I've seen millions come into the kingdom of God. and I've, You know, the, the, that's just God's grace. That's God's enablement. That's God's empowerment. I'll always be a son. My greatest identity will always be a son. Amen. Well, we went about 30 minutes longer than we normally do. And that seems to be par for the course. So um, we're going to be empowering um, Isaac Fogoso to be teaching next week's lesson. And he's going to be talking about uh, the last two types of prophetic um, ministry, which is going to be prophetic prosperity and the gift of prophecy. So because he's going to be teaching that, I'm going to very quickly end, if you don't mind, folks. Can, can I have like seven more minutes? Is that okay? Wave your hands. That's okay. Okay. I, I, I wouldn't go in a long time. I know that. Um. So back to your notes, if you want to go back to your, your uh, syllabus, that I've, your, your, your curriculum that I gave to you. Um, we just talked about the office of a prophet, and I want to talk about what is called prophetic preaching. And, you know, let me just say this, because some of you came from, the, from denominations, and I know you heard it said that anybody who preaches the word is prophesying. And that is not the case. Preaching is not the same as prophesying. They make this very, very clear. Normal preaching is speaking biblical truths, which have been researched, studied, and arranged to present to people. Preaching proclaims logos, while prophecy gives a rhema, an inspired word from logos. I couldn't begin to tell you the pastors that I would preach for or minister for that would tell me, and they were, they were astute teachers, deep, deep teachers of God's word. And they would say, I don't know if I've ever heard God's voice. Because they operated strictly out of the soulish realm of biblical knowledge. Now, God's word is powerful. And you, you can see lives transformed just teaching God's word. But prophetic preaching is a spontaneous thing that becomes driven by inspiration and revelation knowledge. You know, today I was reading the notes here and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit shifted me prophetically to start speaking to you just from what the Holy Spirit wanted to say. It wasn't notes in front of me. It was something God directed me to share with you. And so, so that prophetic preaching is where maybe you start off with a subject and you've got it laid out. And nothing wrong with that. I, I, I'm very, very, uh, I'm for um, structured teaching. But God's anointing can come upon you and you'll go into a prophetic level of teaching or sharing or preaching. So, you know, preaching, prophetic preaching is on a different level than preaching the word. And here's some of the qualities of it. Preaching is very appropriate and comprises the majority of messages that ministers deliver. That's my uh, alarm telling me I've gone way too long. <laughs> so I apologize, everybody. I'm going to hurry. But training and preparation of sermons, which is called homiletics, and how to deliver them, you know, pulpit speech, and, and, and studying prophetic events in history, eschatology, you know, that's a very customary kind of way of delivering the word in denominations. And a preacher may ever prepare the notes and have general thoughts in mind and allow God to fill in as he ministers. Well, 
you know, God may have him say things here and there. And even though that preaching is anointed and led by the Holy Spirit, it's not what we would call prophetic preaching. The minister's sensitivity to the Holy Spirit should be preaching messages at God's direction. Or, you know, as I love Bill Johnson because I never see Bill Johnson reading from notes. And he says profound, incredible kingdom things. And he's just talking as God's leading him, as God's bringing it to him. So prophetic message has its place, but it does not seem to, to constitute the majority of a message that God will deliver. So prophetic preaching is literally when you had a plan to say this and you get up to teach or you go to share that with someone and God just suddenly shifts you. And you're over here saying da 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 as the spirit is directing you. So here are some of the attributes of prophetic preaching and I'm, I'm gonna go through them uh, kind of swift to, let, to give you folks the rest of your evening and not take up too much more of your time. But um, <clears throat> prophetic preaching, first of all, must be biblical truth. Just like prophecy, the prophetic message will be subordinate to the word of God, which is the standard by which we judge, which means just because God takes you away from your outline or your notes doesn't mean you start preaching something that's out of God's word. Everyone understand that? That's, that's pretty basic. Number two, prophetic preaching is by unction of the Holy Spirit. Your words and illustrations are exactly what God wants you to say and how God wants you to say them. The minister is directed to share certain truths, but he's also directed to say them in a certain way or certain order or to use divinely directed illustrations. And when you do it according to God's way, there's powerful impact and accuracy that smites people's hearts. There are times when I'm, when I'm speaking that God will move on me and tell me to give an illustration a certain way. And I'd be like, God, I don't want to tell that story. But it's not my choice. I've got to, I've got to move in the direction that God's leading me. So number three, prophetic preaching is meant for people present at the time. And although the truths being spoken are biblical and would no doubt be in benefit to anyone who could hear them, much of the message is specifically directed to those that are present at that time. Therefore, when prophetic instructions are given, admonitions are given, and they will be treated as prophecy and don't just count it as the body of Christ at large. You see, this is one thing that, that social media has caused an issue. Because there are prophetic ministers or prophets that will speak to a house a certain word for that time, for that place. But because it gets shown on YouTube, everybody's like, oh, I'm claiming that for myself. Oh, I'm, that's my prophecy. He's talking to me. And that's a mistake. Because then you go away and then you're frustrated because it doesn't happen. Well, it's because you can understand that that, prophetic word was that house. I'm not saying that the unction of God can't fall on you to where you feel a witness and you just say, Lord, wow, I think that also applies to me. And that could happen. But don't just arbitrarily go. Steps don't work in the kingdom because a prophet gets up and tells the church to do certain things. Like, like, I was at a meeting and I heard a prophet telling this pastor that every time you saw a penny, because he was needing a, a miracle to get their building, every time you find a penny, if you pick that penny up and put it up to heaven and say, thank you, Lord, for supplying our needs, pennies from heaven, God will give you the miracle. Well, this pastor started doing that. Every penny he saw, he picked it up and put it in heaven, pennies from heaven. God, I'm claiming a miracle. And then within six months, God allowed like $1.5 million to be sold into his ministry to get a building that God had promised him. Well, I laugh about it, but I pick up pennies all the time and say pennies from heaven, but I haven't seen the million dollars yet. Because <laughs> that, that's not a step. That's not a magic formula that you just go and do. You know, come on, people. Um, sometimes I'm, people go, in Roman, or someone comes to tell, 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 tell me, a prophet told me, do X, Y, Z. I'll ask him, where was the prophet at? Well, I saw him on YouTube. <laughs> 
It was a message that was preached eight years ago. I'm like, no, no. Come on, really? <laughs> All right, I gotta hurry. So number four, any fivefold ministry can engage and function in prophetic preaching at the direction of the Lord. And again, you don't have to be a prophet to do prophetic preaching or prophetic teaching or prophetic singing. It's just what the anointing moves on you for that particular um, time. Then, then there's prophetic presbytery, and that's um, teams that God brings together. This is this prophetic presbytery happens in a house or an apostolic center where constant prophetic training is being given. Then you get seasoned prophetic ministers come up. They're not prophets, but they are seasoned in knowing God's voice and flowing in the gift of prophecy. And this is where prophetic ministry becomes led by this team of women and, or men of God, and, and, and they prophesy accurately. They're known for, for being accurate in their prophetic words, and they have qualification of presbytery, which is Titus and Timothy wrote about the bishopric. Their lives are in order, their character. Of course, this doesn't, doesn't eliminate the need for a prophet, but many houses can be led by prophetic presbytery, and it's very powerful. And you know when these proven team of ministers get together, especially if they want to prove a word. You know, I've had times where someone got up and gave a prophetic word and there was prophetic presbytery present. Elders, people, the Bible says that, let one speak and the others judge. You're not judging the person, but the word gets judged. And the people are saying, man, that was a crazy word. That was just way out there. But then God moves on the prophetic elders and they come together and they start talking and they pray and they say, you know what? This is from God. This is, this is God speaking. You know, it could be, so don't just judge a word because it seems like it's crazy. I mean, think about the prophets in the Bible. God told Ezekiel to lay on his side for a year and to eat bread cooked over cow patties. <laughs> and then to lay on his other side for three more months and nobody came into the kingdom. When Ezekiel's wife died, God said, you're not going to mourn for her. Go bury her, but don't shed a tear. There's some crazy things that came forth prophetically. And you look at them on the natural, like, why would God do that? Sometimes his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And sometimes it is for examples. So the functions of prophetic presbytery is gathering proven elders, not to manipulate, dominate, control. But I think prophetic houses, especially when you start having a lot of people operating and you're letting people practice to really to, to, to determine if words are truly accurate and something that should be broadcast, published for everybody to pay attention to. This is a word from God. So when prophetic revelation comes forth in confirmation for people to be called in leadership, you know, someone to be placed in a leadership place, and that Acts 13 shows us that. Prophetic presbytery really works well in confirming that. When you're going to ordain someone to be a prophet or an apostle, and I believe that you can be, it's kind of like, you know, in the Bible, David was anointed to be king by Saul, Samuel, but then 13 years later, the people of Hebron anointed him king. And then he became king of Israel. You can be anointed to be an apostle or a prophet, but there comes, there's got to come a point in time where you sit before elders, that are spiritual fathers that are apostles and prophets or a, 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 a presbytery of some sort that ordain you and recognize the anointing on your life. There's value in that. It's not control. It's just value and recognizing, yes, we vetted this person. They, are, they have a lifestyle. They, they're, they're living for God. And I think this is something being missed in the charismatic, loose dimension where prophets can just get on, on YouTube and become sensations overnight. And you know nothing about the character. You know nothing about their ministry. Nothing. And there's no elder speaking over them saying, I've known this man, I've known this woman for 15 years. They are godly. So let's be careful about that. Now, I asked God about this. Why so many prophets were getting on YouTube and stuff like that and getting a million hits? 
in six months and three months and becoming household names. And God said, you'll know them by their fruit. I'm letting all this happen because I'm separating the sheep from the goats. And before it's all said and done, the true nature and character of someone's going to be seen. And from the midst of it, true prophets, true apostles, true men and women of God are rising up. Also for confirmation and activation of, of ministries within the church, the members, Acts 6 and 3, the leaders perceive Stephen's giftings. Verse 6, laid hands on pain for the activation of that ministry. So there's something that can be deposited with these prophetic prosperity teams. They're building blocks to, 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 to progress believers in Christian maturity. You can see this in Acts 14, verses 20 through 23, where the presbytery was in action. The presbytery in this interest both served to benefit the saints and to ordain the ministry. And uh, Steve Soltz, who um, heads up the Elijah's list, has, a, has really good um, uh, information on this, on uh, a practical guide for prophetic gatherings and books he has. But I, I am 100% for prophetic presbytery. I believe in this hour, God's going to raise seasoned fathers and mothers to have relationships to help steady the course of what's been going on across the nation with the influx of so many prophetic words uh, going forth. For instance, about Trump's presidency, presidency, second term. There's a possibility Trump very well may have a second term. And maybe a lot of these prophets saw the second term and they immediately thought it was this second term and immediately following his first term. He could very well come back. And, 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 and serve again as president of the United States and, and whatever it's going to be, 2024 or whenever it is. And so I'm, I'm very cautious about going and, and, and labeling people false prophets because they miss an area. Because there's so many areas in a person's life that determine a false prophet, whether their character, their doctrine, and yes, the accuracies of their words. But it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's just a whole gamut of things and, and it's better when you have relationships, spiritual fathers and mothers in your life to where those things can be worked out. And I believe God's putting that prosperity in place even as we speak now. I don't know the full scope of it or how it's going to operate, but I do believe over the next year to two years, we're going to see this come into picture where godly known elders and men and women of God that are – that. Uh, are, are godly are going to help bring some balance and stabilization to the scene of the prophetic. All right, guys, I went longer than seven minutes and I'm so sorry, but I did finish that part. Uh, any more questions, comments, we get off. Has this been okay tonight? All right, guys, we love you. We love you so much. Thank you for joining us. <coughs> And uh, I hope I'm not wearing you out. But uh, God bless you. And Lord willing, we will see you next Thursday. <clears throat> Be in prayer with us. Jennifer and I are flying to Cal to Florida to do some ministry uh, this week. And we coming, coming back next Thursday. I pray that my flights go all smooth on Thursday so that we can be on line. Yes, Crystal, what's your question? Um, yes, um, my question and refers to from the, 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 the first part of your message, um, we were talking about uh, um, um, uh, a prophet um, anointing and laying hands on, 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 on someone and releasing um, what God has, uh, yeah, seasons. And uh, um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to take you so many times. I, I think I should have jumped in earlier. Because this has been real long, and I'm sorry I didn't do that before, but I didn't want to disturb the flow of the message, so that's why I waited till the end. But anyway, I believe that I'm going through um, something like that, a great um, season of darkness, and um, and I can't really um, put it all into words only in just a few minutes, but I know for a fact that the Lord is bringing me out of that. It was spoken to me, um, um, this release, me going into the next phase um, of my life, the ne next step of my life um, um, to the, uh, with the Lord. 
and everything, but I've been in this, still in this darkness, and I believe that I'm delivered from all this spiritual oppression, all this spiritual attack. I believe in 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 my healing. I claim that I actually live that in my in my spirit. I mean, I believe all of that. But it's like um, like you, I heard you uh, in the old preaching before of yours. We were saying that all these things, um, what the Lord said is is already done. But we're living in the remnant, basically. And I feel that's where I'm at right now. And um, why don't, go ahead. why don't Jennifer and I just we'll agree with you in prayer, and we'll see if okay. the Lord directs us. Okay. We'll pray this over you for season end, new season beginning. Um, and okay. I'll reach out to you. I don't literally have to be in the same room with you. We can do Zoom and I can decree it over you to be the same as if I lay hands on you. But let, let, let Jennifer and I talk about this and pray and we'll, we'll, we'll get back in touch with you. Okay. Is that all right? I think she froze. Okay. I'm not going to hold everybody unless you have a question, but God bless everybody. God bless you. God bless you, brother, pastor. God bless you. We love, love you. you guys. Love you. God bless you. Good night. God bless you. Good night, everyone. This side will be breakfast, and this side will be talking.